address the topic of the uh, brainstorm article we did uh, a few weeks ago and the and the podcast that kind of followed up on it. And I mean, we had some great discussion going on MTG the source, and we've got about 20 pages of good discussion. Uh, however, um, we wanted to kind of expand on this a little bit and talk about some more points. So we actually have a guest on today, a Mr. Benjamin Wheeler, known from SCG Top 8 fame as well as being an excellent local player in the Metro Vancouver slash Victoria area who has come on and wants to talk about kind of some of the issues that we were we were thinking about a couple of weeks ago. So Ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi everybody, Benjamin Wheeler. Um, yeah, I've played a couple of brainstorms in my life. Try to go to as many SCG tournaments as a uh, Canadian can. And uh, I, I guess I feel pretty passionate about this subject. And um, while I have played many a brainstorm, I've also been on the other side of the table playing against it. And um, I worked with Matt a bit on creating this article. And it's interesting to see a lot of the type of feedback we get and also a lot of the confusion surrounding, uh, I guess, the idea we were trying to put out there. And I think that's the main thing that we definitely want to clear up is some people thought we were maybe trying to say one thing when we really meant something else. And that's and that's kind of really what we want to clear up, even though that statement doesn't really mean much. It wasn't like, a, you know, the end-all solution to brainstorm. Just give your credit card number here and we will show you how to beat those blue mages. It was more of a, you know... How this is how you can attack this card without kind of giving up consistency for very targeted cards, such as Chalice of the Void. So, uh, also too, I just want to address the fact that a lot of people, um, at least on Reddit, which is a real just cesspool, in my opinion, um, have uh, have actually attacked me just on uh, they 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 took a per- they took this article as a personal attack against Jeff Hoogland which uh, it was really not meant to be. So I just want to, for those people who were really uh, really on top of me about attacking Jeff, and I, I really wasn't, because if you notice, the, um, the entire thing separates, you know, the article from the author, which, you know, you are supposed to do when you critique someone, you know, because that's the way we do it when we're educated and such, you know. So for anyone who did think that, I'm sorry that you thought that, but you're wrong. Yeah, you're right. Matt did not attack Jeff Hoopman. That was me. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that was that I was have Jacob. I no problem with making those calls because, you know, sometimes you got to call out. It's it's just not it's it's not like a a big grand like, hey, this is in terms of competitiveness. No. This is one man's gripe against a format that is very tough to crack and has a lot of unfair cards. Sometimes it's not for everyone. As well, um, I had talked about how certain decks were made in America versus Europe. And, again, a lot of people really jumped on top of the fact that I had... I know, we're, we're, I, I think I should still address it because it was a major issue. Um, that certain decks were created in certain areas. Now, if you notice, uh, I attributed uh, whether or not a deck was created or popularized in a certain region. So... Now, I mean, I'll give credit where credit is due. I mean, some of the decks that I did list were created by um, American players, but were only played and popularized in Europe before coming back to America. So, I mean, we can talk about Patriot Delver, um, Charlotte Bog, Imperial Painter, did have a lot of American influence in starting up, but it's very hard to sometimes kind of say who actually made the deck, who took the yeah, time to make I think, f- I think we're splitting hairs at that point. It's exactly like who like took who, the time to make a forum who created post. The deck. I mean, yeah, if the person who created the deck also did well with it, then yeah, it's pretty easy to say, oh, you know, uh, I don't know. Let's let's call. Uh, let's take a, a deck like uh, High Tide. Right? Who's probably more most responsible for putting that deck on the map in the last five years? Fleen Longmore. Right. She certainly didn't invent the deck. Very true. People aren't going to play High Tide because they read a thread on the source about a deck that casts High Tide, taps a bunch of valence, and untaps a bunch of valence, and it taps a bunch of valence, and 
Yeah, there's a lot of blue instants with that. And even for high tide, you could like go back to the old spring tide versions uh, that Cloud of Fairies or even Solidarity and say, yeah, that's where the deck originally originated. And I think that's that wasn't the point that Matt wanted to, uh, to prove. Right. It's not so much who came up with uh, Cobalt Glimpse. <laughs> <Yeah. Dead. laughs> oh, no, that was my neighbor. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, if we're playing it like who created this deck, then we should all be picking up uh, Nourishing Lich. And oh, uh, oh, baby. <laughs> so hot. I mean, we don't really have so the, it, it the is luxury. Be a deck. You always have to plan for it, right, Julian? <laughs> oh, always, always. And I'm always prepared. I don't know about you guys, but you really should get in your testing. But what I wanted to say is, like, we don't uh, always have the luxury of, of a deck being named after the creator, like Maverick. So, who created Maverick? Yeah, that was Maverick. So, <laughs> it's not always that easy. Right. Otherwise, everyone in uh, Legacy would be playing AJ Soccer Doc Deck. Huh. That's huh, funny. Because <laughs> it's Brainstorm. No, no, I no, no, I got it. Yeah. No, it's good. So back, I mean, so I mean, you know, kind of flipping through this uh, this thread on the source, there's 20 pages of both good and bad arguments as to you know why Brainstorm should either be banned, restricted, cards printed against it, cards unbanned, banned, like. There's a lot of different uh, ways that people have kind of wanted to address what we can call the Brainstorm problem. And first, I think, w can we all agree that Brainstorm is the best card at what it does? Are we all... In Legacy. Yeah, I would say Brainstorm is the only card that can do what it does. Yeah, I think it's unique. It's it's a very unique magic card. No... See beyond. <laughs> instant... <laughs> Latbam's Legacy. To, uh, is able to fix your hand. Oh, see beyond the sorcery. Legacy. Hold on, I'm looking that up. It's a slow trip see beyond from like alliances. Oh, hold on. Choose a card from your hand and shuffle that card into your library to draw two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. Ooh, that's so good. Uh, and, see and see beyond is like draw two, shuffle one back. Yeah. Back. At sorcery speed, oh. two mana. Right. I guess like Jace is a close comparison, but. Jace has essentially plus zero brainstorm, so it's kind of like brainstorm's really the uh, the inspiration rather than trying to emulate. Okay, I found the topic. We'll get to it after uh, after this one. So I mean, w I just want to make sure we're all on the same track to say that you know brainstorm is the best card at you know increasing consistency and drawing cards and putting crap back and you know. I think I think we can all agree it is a very 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 good card. Honestly, if you want to ask me about increasing consistency, I would even say that's Fetchlands, but that's kind of in the same vein as Brainstorm, so because they're well, I pretty mean, much Brainstorm wasn't together. really used that much in Legacy before the Fetchlands were printed, right? Um, well, Brainstorm was definitely played in the format, but not as, it wasn't as powerful though. No, not as powerful. But like you could th still use it with certain shuffle effects, and even like going way, way back, um, running the old kind of fle fetch lands, like the Mirage ones. Yeah, I, I remember there was like a 1999 World Champ deck, which was like an extended, and it was like a Counter Slivers. I think that was the first real memory I have of Counter Slivers, and it used Brainstorm. And Mirage fetch lands with Force of Will and you know Hibernation Sliver to pick it up back to your hand so you could pitch it to Force of Will. Um, but mostly I think it was good because it had four copies of the Mana Consultation. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty busted deck. Well, I think this was. Yeah, this was still before Necropotence or Dark Ritual got banned. So makes you kind of makes you kind of wonder how good Brainstorm was in that format. So I mean, do we want to go to the the Twitter question quickly, and then because this, well, like this is getting a, unorganized? Uh, yeah, it certainly is. Just because I jumped in. Um, well, the Twitter question is: Why are there so many heavily lopsided matches in Legacy? For example, lands versus Storm, Miracles versus Twelve Post, Burn versus uh, Three Color Dual Deck, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wouldn't actually call so those matchups really lopsided, would you? I mean, yeah, y you can make a case for like Lance versus Storm, but even like Burn versus Three Color, whatever, isn't like that lopsided, really. I'm thinking more like th Burn versus like Jund or Junk, where they really there's really not much way for those decks to interact with the Burn spells. Yeah, so heroes like, resolve. Interactive matches. Essentially, what I think the question is getting at 
why are there so many non-interactive matches matchups um and i think most of that is at least i think the thesis of it is going to be there are some decks in legacy that don't seek to interact with the opponent that is they have such a linear game plan they are able to execute it regardless of what the opponent is trying to do that or like the interaction that they choose to have for instance like lands they get those you know that sideboard slot for what do i want to fight today and their way of interacting so to speak with something like storm is something that tries to reduce uh the interaction to a complete zero through something like a thorn of amethyst or a sphere of resistance the other matchups that were listed are you know not the most interactive but i wouldn't exactly call them unwinnable i mean i agree i i basically think you just get to pick your interaction and and that's how you get to go in legacy like i mean miracles versus anything permanent based is going to have a real problem i mean miracles versus 43 lands awkward you know but whereas miracles against creature based deck well you know how do you do terminus becomes a really good card I think I think the matchups are maybe not quite as lopsided as as people are saying. It's, there's I don't think there's many 85-15 matchups in Legacy. I mean I can't. I mean what's what's a is there a, a 100% zero that you can really think of that's like it just can't win? I imagine Manalus Dredge versus uh, Ley Lines is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you have to hit can, the right Ley Line. Yeah, because they can they can still whiff on the Ley Line of. The void. Yeah, but the, if you know you're playing against Manila Stretch, you can really mulligan into it pretty, pretty well. So yeah, I, I, I actually I do think there are some like really lopsided eighty twenty matchups. For instance, Belcher versus anything that doesn't play blue. Even then, I think people are way overestimating or overstating these these percentages. To me, if a matchup is more th than like sixty five, thirty, thirty five, thirty five, that's already really rare. So. If you think about it, if you've got like a 65% uh, win percentage, that's pretty, pretty good. That's really good. So if people tell me that like, yeah, this matchup is really bad, it's like 80-20, I don't know. I feel that's that's too much. I, I feel there are hardly any 80-20 matchups in Legacy anyways, especially if you account for like sideboarding and maybe even metagaming. Yeah, that is true. Uh, with sideboard games, you're definitely going to change those, hopefully more towards an equal yeah and that's what i mean like uh, equal percentage. It, it doesn't really make a lot of sense just talking about game ones because you really try to to make up for your weaknesses in your sideboard usually so overall like match match win percentages 80 20 should be really rare and i couldn't even think about a, a match like that well most people that kind of throw the statistic of like 80 to 20 is they're go only going off like 20 matches or so right they don't even have enough um, kind of yeah, data. Usually, yeah, usually it's like ten matches and they call it a day. They played it against it in like two tournaments, lost both times, and then they say, "Yeah, the matchup's ninety ten. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds I feel like about those right. Those matchups are uh, whenever I play a green deck and I face Rug, Delver. It's usually for me like, man, I cannot even get a second land into play. It's because you're fetching at the wrong time. Man, like, I don't know, we have this Rug Delver player at our store. New guy. Really nice guy. But, I mean, he's playing, like, Stifle Rug, and everybody just keeps losing. And I'm like, whoa, did none of you remember how to play against Stifle? You know, you fetch lands in their upkeep, so they can't play anything. You just gotta play more fair. There's, there's a whole generation of legacy players, like, people that have gotten in in the past year or so, that, you know, maybe they've come across Stifle, but they haven't, you know faced stifle for four rounds in a row kind of thing just due to the fact that rug isn't as popular as it was i guess I, among you know all the players and not just like the top grinders yeah i usually when i lose those games with playing green versus rug it's because it goes land green creature then they go submerge to time walk and when i go to fetch they stifle and then days my next play and at that point, I'm just ready to throw the deck across the room. But I mean, there are times that the Delver decks, which I think is an important uh, an important thing that we need to talk about, is Delver, TNN, whatever. Uh, the Delver decks do have, I would almost say, unbeatable plays of, like, Delver, you know, Days Force Will back up, 
um, stifle or double delver draws where they're just you know beating down for six and you have no lands in play. But, yeah, but even and then, is like calling it unwinnable or I don't know. I mean, you can still play just land, land, abrupt decay. So even then, well, yeah, if you have basic, basic, abrupt, sure. Yeah, and people play basic lands, so. No, no, but I'm just saying. Uh, there are what I call like the the really yeah, yeah the really strong card. hands are re I mean yeah they are like an aggressive deck like if an aggro control deck draws a perfect hand it's really hard to keep up but overall it's not like unbeatable because yeah okay <laughs> for sure you don't see those hands all the time yeah. but and that's actually one of the things that we're going to talk about probably now or in a few minutes is like well is brainstorm the problem or is it just the other cards that are played with brainstorm that are really the issue I'd say it's brainstorm. I mean, it's I calling it a a problem might be a bit of a stretch. I mean, it is there's something should be done to it, but whether or not it's deal with the card specifically or uh, add cards to the uh, card pool that allow some kind of counterplay, um, that's the real question. I mean, I'm always in at least for me. I don't know about about say Julian and Jacob, but. I'm always in favor of either unbanning cards or printing more cards instead of limiting my card pool. What about you guys? Julian first, I guess. Well, um, for me, I I mean, I really don't mind Brainstorm all that much, honestly. And I think I have some leeway here because I have been playing a non-Brainstorm deck for quite a while. I have also been playing like pretty much every deck in Legacy for, let's say, some time. And... Honestly, I really don't mind Brainstorm all that much. I mean, I can see why people hate on it and why people really, really dislike playing against it. But to me, that sometimes even feels like they are looking for a scapegoat. Like for, oh man, come on. I, I mean, really, some, sometimes people are like, hey, come on, he had three or four Brainstorms. How could I win? Yeah. I mean, we all know that something like this doesn't really make sense. I mean, yeah, percentage-wise, it probably helped him for a bit. But really, to me, I don't mind the card all that much. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both Benjamin and Julian with regards to the strength of Brainstorm as a card in a vacuum. It's really just a cantrip. I mean, yeah, granted, you're able to kind of sculpt your hand, generate uh, card quality rather than card advantage, but uh, you never hear someone saying, oh, I lost because my opponent cast a Brainstorm. You may hear, like, my opponent cost three Brainstorms to my one Brainstorm, Right, so that describes more about the card quality throughout the game. And of course, you also have to set up those plays, so you certainly tell it was at least two turns, possibly even three turns of hand sculpting. But you can never really attribute a loss or a win directly to Brainstorm. And I think in that respect, it's not, um, it's not Brainstorm is necessarily at fault. I mean, it's certainly a very, very good magic card. And there's some, probably a very good reason why 60-70% of winning decks play it. Because it's really good at what it does, which is reduce variance. Yeah, but even there, I mean, reducing variance, that's kind of... That doesn't even say if it's good or... I mean, it's good, but everything we do kind of tries to reduce variance in a way. Like, you play fetch land, so you're more consistent. You play a mana curve, so you can use your mana at most turns, so... I mean, when people say, oh, it, it increases consistency, it's too good, that doesn't really convince me. Like, I mean, I've experienced the power of Brainstorm, and it sh sometimes really feels like an Ancestor Recall, but the truth is, it isn't. And if your deck is highly vulnerable to specific cards, yeah, Brainstorm goes up in value against you. But if you're playing, like, a consistent deck, your opponent playing Brainstorm doesn't really add all too much to his deck, like, in the way that he has suddenly all these good cards against you that he didn't have before. Oh, it's still just, like, a very good cantrip. And that's typically how, like, I guess the non-Brainstorm decks end up overcoming the Brainstorm decks. They're not playing these, you know, sectioned-off cards that are meant to attack Brainstorm, but rather just looking to increase their overall consistency through, you know, having as many of their best cards as possible. So let's, let's kind of take that, because there's historically been one very blue deck that chose consistently to not play Brainstorm, and that's Merfolk. And I know we talk about Merfolk kind of as a uh, budget choice, but what is it, for instance, about Merfolk as a mono-blue deck 
that doesn't play Brainstorm. How is that? Why is that important? How is that different from the rest of the blue decks in Legacy? It's um well like you're trying to play as many lords as possible, and all your lords buff your other lords. You're playing kind of this pack rat game of Magic where you can have other cards in your hand that do things, but more often than not, you just rather be um, pumping out lord after lord after lord there isn't necessarily time to have manipulation and why do you need it if your deck is constructed uh in such a way that's my thoughts on the deck you're playing this pack rat magic you're looking to do the same thing you don't need brainstorm to find your other lords because the slots you would have as brainstorm are lords in themselves and you don't have time to be using that kind of manipulation it's not as though you're playing this game of here are your spell pierces and here are your lightning bolts. Some games you'll want your lightning bolts, some game you'll want spell pierce. Every single game you're going to want Lord of Atlantis. And this is like the way how Burn deals with his own consistency, right? I mean, it's just like every card is hopefully a lightning bolt in some, in some form. Let's do that. Also, a blue deck that doesn't use, to, that really has not used Brainstorm is also Sea Stompy. Just going to put it out there. Yeah, it's all about the sea stompy. Throwback from two thousand and nine. Exactly. I lately played against exactly. it. It was really cool. <laughs> and I mean, and even look at Zoo, right? Zoo is a deck where every creature is, you know, one mana for a two three or a three three or two mana for a four five. Like that's all you want to do. And as long as and you, and I think the thing is, a lot of people think that Brainstorm is like I need this card to increase my consistency. But if your internal consistency is already really good, like with Merfolk Zoo burn do you really need this card and i think the answer is you know what you don't i, I remember num numerous years back almost like three or four years back i went first started playing in the uh, star city open series i think this was the first tournament i played and i took a, a bant deck so uh not to be confused with the bad deck uh very true uh so pretty much this is like green white with blue maverick and the blue is almost strictly for Click, Brainstorm, and Jace. So pretty much card selection, because I think at that time, Green Sun Zenith hadn't been printed. Uh, I believe it was still playing Tarmogoyfs, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, the, the, the deck also featured Stoneforge Mystic, and I think it was like in the middle of round three, I was like super ahead on board, and I had both Brainstorm and Stoneforge Mystic and a second Stoneforge Mystic in my hand. I'm like, well, I need to get the equipment out, so play the first one and I happen to have an extra mana so I'm like well all right let's brainstorm put the equipment back play a second stone forward mission get some more card quality I'm like wow this is this is actually pretty good pretty good card to be able to do that and I don't think decks like merfolk burn zoo uh, even elves I don't think elves really benefits much from brainstorming I think I'd actually slow it down um due to that internal consistency, that redundancy that Matt mentions. Um, those kinds of decks don't really want to be able to find a better version of the card. They just want a version of a card that fits X, Y, or Z criteria. In contrast, for instance, to a deck like Stoneblade, which has a lot of situational cards, and it needs to be able to pick the correct set in any given matchup. And that a deck like that, Brainstorm, is immensely powerful and immensely important. So then the question is, as a non-blue player, if you're playing a deck that either can't play Brainstorm or doesn't want to play Brainstorm, how are you fighting against all of the other Brainstorm decks then? Consistency. Like, just have good cards be kind of like a good stuff deck. If you're playing like, I, I don't know, something like Chunk. I'm not telling you play Chunk so we can crush Brainstorm because I don't think... I'm telling you to play Chunk. <laughs> okay, great. No, if you're just playing like a very consistent deck where every card has like an impact on the board or at least, I don't know, does something. Like, it's not a spell pierce, it's not whatever you wanna, want it to be, but it's a real card. If you, got, if you max out on these, typically these decks you had a good matchup against most of the tricky brainstorm whatever decks that play lots of niche cards that have a high impact but otherwise are useless so yeah that's what i feel Pro proactive magic that uses your mana every single turn if possible yeah right. like so decks like jund junk 
Dega. Green, white, Maverick. Death, Dega. Dead Gael, the black, white, little creature deck. Merfolk, goblins, elves, zoo. What else can we come up with? Dega. Voucher. <laughs> Please don't make me learn these names. Uh, Team Italia, black, uh, black, white, red. Ah, okay. The most ugliest of color combinations in Magic. I got to fetch for a plateau, though, oh. in Legacy. <laughs> Which plateau? Were you casting Blood Moon with it? Please please say you're casting Blood Moon. Uh, no, I was actually casting a Red Elemental Blast on a True Nemesis, so it was ah. pretty good. Very, very good. The only reason to actually play plateau. But you know what? That deck is actually quite good. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think about those color combinations just because I'm all about the Tarmogoyf. Just saying. Not about the Lightning Bolt. But in a deck filled with, like, Swords of Plowshares, Lightning Bolt, Lingering Souls, Him to Turok, Liliana the Veil, and out of the board you get Chains of Mephistopheles, Zealous Persecution, Red Elemental Blast. Like, that deck is actually surprisingly good against the Delver decks. I'm just going to put it out there. It made a bit of a splash when um, Delver started really gaining in popularity. And people th and also when Stoneforge started gaining in popularity and people were playing, you know, the Stoneforge, Bob, Grim, Lavamancer kind yeah. of pile of cards. And that's what I'm playing. And Grim Lavamancer is a hell of a card. It's pretty nice when you're not worried about your Tarmogoyf count. Agreed. So, I mean, what what else do we want to talk about on this? Uh, I think I think also the problems with a lot of these arguments uh, that were coming up on the thread was in a lot of tournaments, we actually don't know how many people played each deck is part of the yeah, problem. Yeah, I think this is what I mentioned um, towards the end of it. It's actually impossible, nearly impossible, at least during when you're playing the tournament, to actually know the composition of the format in that room. So, for instance, you could be playing in Arizona, and literally 25% of a room is playing a burn deck. Or you could be playing in New England, and 75% of the room is playing Brainstorm Fetchland decks. So I think it's kind of hard to, like... Hard to say, like, oh, I mean, you know, we see 70% of the top eight being a Brainstorm-based deck. And the question is, is it, the questions are, you know, A, is the strategy the same in each of those Brainstorm decks? Is that a Delver deck versus a Miracles deck? Does the fact that they have Brainstorm make it a Brainstorm deck? You know, you can kind of argue that. Uh, and if 70% of the meta is Brainstorm, then should 70% of the top eight be Brainstorm? Well, you know, you would think so. But then you could, you know, you could also say, well, why is the meta seventy percent brainstorm? We don't know about the the people in the room and their deck selection, uh, what cards they have available. We we don't know those things. And I think until like we have big tournaments really going, okay, there were three hundred and eight people, and there were fifteen people playing Jund, and there were twelve people playing, so we can really get a breakdown. I think it's going to be a little bit harder to kind of say brainstorm is OP. People also tend to tunnel vision on say the top eight. Or most importantly, they tunnel vision on the whomever you know, whatever deck won the actual tournament itself, instead of looking towards the top sixteen or even just anybody that only you know was X and one or X and two, um, and they say, well, okay, the brainstorm, you know, look at the top eight, it's all brainstorms, and then you s just go outside that bubble, and then you find stuff like mono red sneak attack and maverick and. You know, all these little gems, and who knows, maybe they had to mulligan down to five and they didn't make top eight because of that. And that doesn't exactly make that deck, uh, you know, a poor choice or kind of say, well, oh, there you go, definitive proof that a Brainstorm will crush this strategy no matter what. But people like to take, you know, these kind of things to the extreme. I think people just like to, to take it easy on the statistics because if, if you're honest, you should be, like Matt mentioned, uh, looking at the entire meta game, what percentage was playing this deck, what percentage was playing this, this deck. And if you want to like have a really meaningful statistic, you even should have to account for how good is this player. Yeah, m matchups, yeah, like over the course of the, in the, the entire tournament. But hopefully that evens out. But even then, it probably isn't. But you also have to account for like like skill and, and experience and proficiency in the format. Um, I, mean, I know this is anecdotal, anecdotal evidence, but if I take like our local metagame in Munich, we have tournaments each month of about 30 to 40 people, and you usually see almost always like the entire 
the the same six or seven guys on the top tables in the end. And these people are usually playing different decks, or let's say half of them are playing different decks. And it really isn't that much about what you play, but about how you play it. And if you build a decent deck and you know how to play it, and you also know how all of the other decks in the format work, it's not that important whether you're playing Brainstorm or not. And I feel that's like the big point for me about the card. I mean, Ben, I know in Victoria, I mean, what do you guys do to test? Like, I know you've talked to me about this, but like, how does your testing go? Um, it's, I guess, essentially, you point at somebody and give them, you know, the old Mortal Kombat, get over here. You sit down and you grind match after match after match for about two hours or so. And uh, you switch it, I mean, you switch it up. But people also tend to switch up their archetypes a bit, not too much. Um, because, I mean, again, sitting down and having, let's say, two matches against someone isn't exactly definitive proof that, oh, this is how that matchup goes. Uh, don't need to look at that anymore. Or, oh, wow, this, uh, you know what, I didn't draw this one sideboard card and I thought it was supposed to be good in this matchup, so I'm going to add you know, max out my copies to make sure I draw them or remove it entirely or something like that. Um, I think, I guess I'm proud of my community in that respect that they don't tend to, you know, look at just a very small uh, pile of uh, results and say, oh, this is that, let's move on. And I agree, I think... I think really to truly see whether or not Brainstorm decks, or at least in their current iterations and legacy, are better than you know, non-Brainstorm decks, is to have equal amounts of people in a room playing each respective archetype with equally skilled players, recording each of the matchups and seeing how they go, and then having a top eight and seeing like, okay, what happened here? The, I mean, the biggest problem, obviously, with that, getting that, to actually happen is that it's a hell of a lot of work and that also kind of stands true for the people looking at statistics you know ideally we look through the records of you know all the good players in the event people up to top 64 or whatnot talk about their matchups you know how many times did they mull get into the dirt but that's pretty difficult and if you are trying to make an enraged forum post that goes into your into the favor of your opinion you're probably not going to dig that deep probably not hmm. okay so now i have i have an interesting uh, proposition here because i i do have tournament data uh that is all the decks played in the tournament and their placing at the end of a tournament uh probably for uh what like six or seven tournaments in los angeles over the course of the last year and these are events with six or more rounds. Are they the Nightwear weekly? They are the Nightwear, yeah. Um, or the Sunday Legacy? Whatever. The Sunday Legacy, um, pretty much I counted any event that had six more, six or rounds or more, so anything with more than 33 participants. Um, there's prizes on the line, sometimes the prizes vary, but they occur on a regular basis about every six weeks. Um, so I have access to this data, I'm trying to figure out what, uh, how do we want to like plot this data out to make it presentable? What, what, and, and I want to do it at least in a fair way, so at least it's not going in with a bias like, oh, this deck is winning because it's a brainstorm deck. I think what you need to do is figure out like, because a lot of times things are named improperly. Like for me, that's what always gets me is like certain decks are lumped together. Like, so here's here's a categorization that I'm employing. Okay. Um, tempo decks. Typically, they're going to be blue and Delver. It's usually, I think, the highlight is going to be a Delver, is what the main categorization for that is. Um, there's going to be mid range decks, control, and combo. And you want to separate by individual archetype? Um, well, that's kind of like the archetype, and then there's a variant. So, for instance, there's a tempo deck, and there's a rug variant. There's a bug variant. Oh, okay, okay. Blue, white, red variant. Um, and because I don't have access to the DCI reporter matchup results, it's very hard for me to say, well, uh, Rug Delver beat out, you know, mid-range decks at a 10% higher percentage than the bug variations. So 
pretty much what I'm looking at is the final placement based on um, based on relative strength as opposed to absolute strength. And I say that kind of that's a big nebulous idea, but really, based on where it finished in the at the end of Swiss rounds, give it a little point value. So, for instance, if there was 64 participants, uh, anyone in the top eight got let's say one point for each um, round they played and an extra point based on where they ended up in the top eight placing and then let's say top 12 got so the next four positions let's say got uh, an extra point relative to the strength and that top 16 got like one less top 32 got one less than that so on and so forth or depending on the number of uh, people playing and the total amount of decks, which is identical. No, I like that idea. But the idea is essentially, you know, someone who got top 12 had a little bit better record than someone in the top 16. And someone with in the top 16 had a little bit re better record than, say, maybe top 24. And But still a good record, though, nonetheless. That's the whole thing. Right. So based on that, take all the data, sum up all the points that, let's say, an archetype was able to gain in that tournament. And that's essentially the relative strength of that deck in that tournament on that day. Yeah, but then you gotta d divide those points by the number of people actually playing the deck. Otherwise you just get all the blue decks uh, way more points than the other decks. Right? Right. So you normalize it and then you see, for instance, you, you will see a lot of from time to time outliers. For instance, let's say Dragon Stomp, you got ninth place. Or you know, Mono Red Sneak Attack got ninth place. It may have been the only deck in the room there, so it did really well for that archetype. Fortunately, not good enough for, let's say, a top eight, but compared to all the other archetypes played in that room, because, for instance, let's say there's ten people playing blue, white, red, Delver. Well, probably about half of them didn't even make it past an even record. Let's say four and four, or three and three, or whatever. So that kind of brings the total win percentage, or average win percentage across the room, down towards let's say 50 percent whereas the mono red sneak attack may have you know went x and two let's say seven and two or four and two or whatever and so its win percentage is actually quite higher averaged out throughout all the participants playing that deck compared to something more popular like rug or blue white red delver not okay. sure what i could add to that so essentially i have all this data and uh unfortunately it's on my work computer yeah and, and uh, like what kind of um, time frame are we talking? Is it like for a year or for two years? Um, I have it all dated and linked back to the original source of the reporting. So I think I can go back as far as I need to, but I'm kind of pretty much capping it up to about a year. Yeah. For now. Otherwise, well, it's I think like maybe going back to like prior to turn in Nemesis, and then like we'd have a point where like here's true in Nemesis. Right, and it's all time dated, so anyone can kind of add more data later on, for instance, like add a marker saying, here's, this set got released. Um, I can't really imagine much legacy cards got added in the last year to relevant tournament decks, aside mm, from True Name Nemesis. No, I don't think so. So True Name Nemesis, I think, is the last kind of blip on the radar in terms of shaking up the format. So speaking of shaking up the format, as we talked about before, card creation. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> so I mean, Matt, do you have do you have to share your uh, creator card? No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna share. We're gonna work through something together. It's Doran, but with trample. <laughs> How did you know? A zero five trampler. Yeah. <laughs> um, what we were talking about was um, what card could you print to help out the specifically the colors that are really not uh really don't have a lot of stuff of their own to help either combat brainstorm or increase their own consistency. And uh, the card that we had come up with kind of turned into a real Frankenstein of a beast. Just kind of addressed, you know, this card, this blue card, and this blue card, and this blue card, and it just became this anti-everything card. And uh, obviously that's stupid. And we don't want to do that. So uh, Ben and I discussed something else possibly as as another card, just as a thought experiment as to would this be good enough to play in Legacy for the non-blue decks? How would you get blue decks not to play it? And would it be good enough or too good? So, 
So let's let's kind of start off with the big subject, uh, which is legacy has unfettered access to multicolor lands, multicolor decks. Right? I mean, we've seen two color decks very competitive, like blue red, blue white. Maybe not so much blue black and blue green, unless it's like Avenger Land deck or survival or whatever. Uh, but three color decks are more or less the norm. Right, so you classic example, rugged over. Blue is just there to be the support, but it's red for the removal, green for the beatdown. So the win conditions are all non blue. Except for Delver of Secrets. But you know, whatever. Whatever. Uh even blue, white, red. Kinda same idea. Take obviously take Delver out of the picture, but you have the removal and, and true nemesis, but <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> We're gonna sweep that under the rug. Uh, but most your pun was all good. The support spells. So I think the key examples with like those two tempo decks is you have cheap, efficient spells that don't require a lot of non-blue mana commitment. Like Agreed. Stone, Stoneforge Mystic equipment, one mana removal spells, bolt swords, whatever. It's like the luck. The lands adding blue, even though it's your primary, I guess, support. Um, your lands adding blue, there's no real, you know, negative consequence of that. It's like, as far as you're concerned, this is a forest that, oh, by the way, I can tap and cast Spell Pierce or something with it. Right. right. The value of the duels make the deck super easy to construct and the mana base super easy to fix. Yeah, you're never thinking, okay, this will add blue. I mean, all your lands will add blue. That's it's you, It never really comes to mind. It's more, this will cast my Tarmogoyf. Or this will cast my Mongoose or something like that. Now what about, for instance, Bug Delver, which actually starts to break the mold for that kind of strategy. Because you're playing Abrupter Guy, I mean, it, you're playing a three-color deck that's casting, you know, the most off-color card you could. It's it's the Abrupter Guy is you know black green in a you know blue Delver deck, right? And him to Torak and Tomb Stalker. I mean, some a while back they were playing Maelstrom Pulse. Well, the, I mean, it, is that is that too much of a stretch for for a blue deck? Or any three color deck in Legacy to cast two off color. It's well, with Deathrite Shaman certainly makes it a hell of a lot easier. Not to mention the blue. A lot of the blue cards in something like Bug Delver um, are relatively free or so. I mean, Force of Will, you don't actually need that much. Many islands in play. Uh, Days, you only need one. Spell Pierce and whatnot. If you have Deathrite, you don't even need access to blue. Um, where all your threats, your powerhouses, you know, Tombstalker, Goyf, Liliana, whatever your um, threat suite may be, doesn't actually need an island in play for it to, you know, exist. So I think we can establish that pretty much there's a free pass in Legacy to play any combination of three colors without being impeded on mana costs or mana issues outside of just not having enough mana. Yeah, and especially even playing, like you said, two of the same off-color seems to be no problem. So, in card creation, it's like, so say I'm Wizards and I want to print a card that maybe hates on the blue decks to help everybody else out, and I print a black-black spell, or a red-black spell. Do you think if the card was good enough, it would make its way into a blue deck? And the answer is probably. So how how would we create a card that fights blue or brainstorm while still not being able to be played in a blue or brainstorm deck? Suggestions? That's the, big That's the big question. To me, I think the first idea I have is like, it should be hating on non-basic lands. I mean, that's kind of easy because we already got these cards, but most of them are pretty niche and you can't really play them against decks that are not two or three colored. But if there was some kind of way to actually punish those mana bases harder than just Price of Progress, because Price of Progress requires a completely strategic committal, and it's not li like Price of Progress, Progress isn't a utility card, but if you find a way to really punish three color mana bases, uh, I think that could be a way. Obviously the mana cost would also be kind of restrictive to not allow blue. So what if, for instance, there was a card that was printed, uh, there is a card like 
suppression field. Activated abilities cost two additional mana to activate. Uh, I think the one thing hurting this card is it costs two mana. So if, let's say, you're on a draw, the opponent has already had two opportunities to use fetch land. And if they're playing a blue deck, they can probably just counter it quite easily. What if, for instance, we made a card that only costs one mana, and it could be, let's say, a single white mana. Activated abilities of lands cost an additional one mana to play. It punishes wasteland, fetch lands, um, mostly punishes, I mean, it obviously punishes lands, but it also slows down the tempo of the game si quite significantly. Would that be a card that helps fight the brainstorm strategy? I think it would see play, yes. I think, uh, well, I think that, you know, it would see play. It, It's as said, it kind of slows down the game, or at least pushes it to, you know, start on turn three or whatnot, as opposed to starting on turn one. Um, but the problem with that is that it kind of gets lumped into these hate cards. These cards that, you know, they have this targeted... Um, effect but they're also useless at certain points in the game whereas you know dealing with blue you want something more not the best example but something like a loxodon smiter kind of effect where it punishes the brainstorm lists isn't used by the brainstorm lists but if you draw it against say in a mirror match or you draw it against something that isn't looking to play the tempo game you're not that upset because it still has some kind of impact on either the board or the pace of the game from there on out so reasonably could you say that maybe the hate piece you want could be a creature so at least it does something yeah something kind of i mean it's funny because they've been putting out cards that are creatures that are supposed to be hate pieces stuff like spirit of the labyrinth that doesn't really you know make it it you know comes up people get super excited they play four copies of it in every deck that has white without brainstorm for two weeks and then they realize it's not actually that great and then they send it to vintage um <laughs> but having some kind of like card where um it takes advantage of say like a, a mechanic around uh, if your opponent controls an island, it has this effect. So something kind of like Submerge, not necessarily a free card, but say, this I'm, This is not the card I'm saying, but if it were a, a black and a green, you know, target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. If your opponent controls an island, destroy that creature instead the spell can't be countered or something like that you want to say like um it has this effect where in the non-blue matchups you know what sometimes you need that ability but in the blue matchups it's where it really excels and kind of says no you can't do that this is my time to shine or what about having i mean we had talked about this island hate ability basically like you cannot cast a spell if you have lands that could produce blue mana or if you control an island that's, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I rather see that if you control an island, this doesn't happen. Yeah. Rather than you can't cast spells if you don't have blue, because then that creates, well, non-magic for people, which creates no fun, which is admittedly Wizards of the Coast's main concern um, when they create cards. Don't look at True Name Nemesis to kind of back up this statement, but... Ultimately, they want people to want to play their cards. Well, I think that would lend a lot of credence towards expanding the this card cannot be countered by spells or abilities. I think if they want to really push against blue, that's probably the direction where we would need to push harder. Um, I mean, it, historically, people playing against blue get frustrated because none of their spells resolve. And that removes that fun element from the game. You can't advance your your board, your position. What fun is that? And realistically, we've seen a push in the mid-range department, especially in Legacy, because of just the printing of Abrupt Decay. Yeah, but I feel we really have to be careful here, because I feel like we are only about two more uncountable, really good spells away from Blue Tempo becoming extinguished, in a way. 
I mean, right now. Good. <laughs> okay. Sure, um. Good <laughs> Rugged has been a top deck for like close to ten years. Now. I mean, <laughs> if you like that, um, I, I honestly, I would be interested to see how the meta would shape up then. But maybe it's too, too, I don't know, extreme to print more non, uh, uh, like, uncounterable spells. I mean. For me personally, I mean, yeah, why not? But overall, I think it would be quite dangerous to actually have that happen. But yeah, I agree that this is like a mechanic to really, really um, increase the overall performance of the other decks against the so-called blue decks. I mean, you could even have, I mean, the, the, the Frankenstein abortion that we created kind of late night at a McDonald's on, you know. Um, what what exact cards was, was that? Sorry? Uh, can you... What did the card do? Because you mentioned it yeah, several so, times. Yeah, so, okay. So, first, the iteration was... It was a hybrid red-black, red-black card. Two mana. Sorcery speed. Um, when you cast this spell... Wait for it. Add a <laughs> red or black to your mana pool. Oh, boy. I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so, then the ability was... Uh, it was a, basically a mini extirpate. Like, search target player's library for, you know an instant or sorcery card that is not red or black. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's Wednesday, you draw an additional card. If it's Tuesday, destroy target creature. The, and the then bed. shuffle your library afterward. And then, and then shuffle, shuffle your, your library. Your library. <laughs> and then you got to scry one after. No, you scry one, and then, then you shuffle, shuffle your library, and then you scry one again. Oh, jeez. Also, Point it has being... phasing. <laughs> Point and being, the card, card got to the point where it's like, this is a little ridiculous. <laughs> That's the flavor text. <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for flavor text. Obviously. Come on. You have to check the website for the flavor text. <laughs> There's a no. QR code at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the picture is just the QR one code. That, uh, <laughs> that had uh, been running around, and uh, it was red, black, red, black, or white, black, white, black. Choose a number, target player reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-land card from it with converted mana cost equal to the chosen number. That player discards that card. Then an additional clause could be one. The first one is possibly if the exiled card was an instant or sorcery, you extirpate it. Or if white or red was paid to cast, you know, this card, extirpate as well. And that's credit to uh, Mr. Wheeler. I yeah. I thought after kind of looking at the card again, I think it would be better cast or better cost at. Um, kind of that Thopter Foundry mana where it's one black and then hybrid red-white where you like still that. have the same choose a number, they reveal their hand, discard that card and then you have the um, uh, either one of the clauses but that way it's not a double white discard spell or a double red discard spell or something ridiculous like that and it also stays on color as far as red being the new kind of hybrid color for the cranial extraction lobotomy abilities as well as um also just kind of i mean you can add a if this were if red were paid you get to extirpate as opposed to white to kind of incentivize playing it in a red strategy but if you played it in a white strategy itself it's still not that bad i mean it's a discard spell you can splash the color yada 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 um I guess and I would of course you would have to make it a sorcery. I guess I would just play brainstorm in response and hide my best card. Then including any brainstorm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if but it's see that's the thing. It's where does it become too good? Yeah, but honestly, for me, I think what would be quite interesting and something we haven't seen yet is like your regular discard spell, just any kind of discard spell, but it has split second. How would you do, how would you like that? Well, isn't split second just another way of saying cannot be countered by instance or sorceries? Well, you also can't yeah, but it's about by activating Yeah, but abilities. It's, it's about the opponent not getting to brainstorm and hide some cards. Because that's what I hate most about brainstorm, honestly. <coughs> but then the question is, does discard become too good when it cannot be countered? Yeah. But discard is discard <laughs> yeah. is never really too... I mean, I, yeah, it's it like saying Thoughtseize is too powerful, let's ban it in standard. Right, because like discard can only go so far. Where you are, the, I mean, one of the strengths of brainstorm again against the discard is hiding those cards. But because the top of your library is typically safe, so they can make you discard your hand all you want, but you still have the top of your deck to draw an out. 
and because it's not instant speed, they can't exactly get you. Well, what about a what about a thought seize that also fate seals? Jesus Christ! A, a thought seize that, that missed that, the I opponent that for two. Like that, it's like um, uh, agonizing memories or something. And the, Does it cost six the name or sounds something? like it's, yeah, six I mana. Mean, I think the it's effect <laughs> is there. Yeah, the effect is there, which is you know, discard to the top of a library or like discard card and like mill top two cards or something like that, which would be kind of interesting to see. Well, the problem is that if you have some kind of mill and discard typically it's going to be blue and black so then like I, again you want to kind of avoid this mental misstep syndrome of where you print this card to combat these decks and then those decks just end up using that card to fight the card itself yeah i got it let's just print power blast in every color except blue oh <laughs> our market research shows that people like countering blue spells so we printed all these pyroblasts Agothian Blasts, Shivan Blast, Phyrexia Blast, and what's typically white? Sarah Blast. Blast. <laughs> Elephant Blast, what? <laughs> Alabaster. Ah, okay. <laughs> but I think also, too, another uh, an interesting like card creation thing could be Instant Speed Chains of Mephistopheles Creature. I think even just a one-shot effect of, um, let's say, cost Black Black or Red Red or whatever. You know, if a player was to draw a card this turn outside the normal draw step, you know, instead do something else as appropriate to that color. Yeah, I mean, I'm just a bigger fan of you just got changed. Goodbye. Get out of so here. So, for instance, like, I can imagine a red version, like, if a player were to draw an extra card this turn, instead that player dealt, gets dealt one damage. So Ooh, one damage. <laughs> yeah, but then, like, End of Infinite becomes actual lethal. Hopefully. But you the question know. is, do you need to push burn anymore or burn strategies? Because right now, burn is fine. Well, I mean, it's just an example, right? Okay. So it's like something I'm coming up with, like, literally, like, three seconds with thought. Okay. <laughs> I thought you know, maybe you had a list. I've been thinking about for, for years and years and crafting and honing and tuning and designing and developing. Hopefully, like, R&D does. You see, all, all our listeners <laughs> slip. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> the, et the eternal cards that R&D... Uh, makes that are on napkins at lunchtime. They just scribble something. Maybe they get a little like, bit of like three three weeks before the set is released. Three like, three oh, yeah, three hours before it's supposed to go into the system. I'm pretty sure they just create these cards the way I crafted my papers at university, like the night before. <laughs> oh man, there's release tomorrow. Fuck shit. <laughs> okay, let's just print this guy. <laughs> let's name him Tamogoy Fumitsava's Chitter. Yeah, they they sound like fun. They should do it. Yeah. Skull clamp, yeah, no one will ever use this to for nefarious means. I mean, it's got a downside, come on, why would you play it? <laughs> yeah, creature dies, you want to stick around to attack with a little bit bigger creature, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, you also mentioned way early on about instead of maybe banning cards, we either create new cards or unban certain cards. So, what did you have in mind when uh, you're thinking about which card to unban to make the format a little more balanced? Well, I mean, there are a lot of cards we can unban. I mean, I think the list is way too long, and I think the modern strategy of, you know, let's just ban everything that ends up being really good is is not really the way to, to kind of uh, to construct a format, at least in my opinion. I think cards that could come off right away Falling are... Star. Sorry? Falling Star? <laughs> um, just trotting. No. <laughs> uh, I think Black Vice it can easily come off. Um... You don't need Mind Twist. You don't need Earthcraft. Um, World Gorger Dragon, realistically, I mean, it creates some awful game states where you can kind of time out the game, but, you know, it, it's not that good. Point being, I would rather have them release some of these cards out into our hands and kind of let us play around with Mind Twist for a bit and then be like, okay, is Brainstorm still too good? Okay, now let's do something else. Just letting us have more cards. I just want them. I want to play. Imagine I want to play with imagine, Beta Mind okay. Twist. Now imagine the unbound Time Twister. Time Twister is too good. But too good. In my opinion, By, because uh, you have Time Spiral at six mana, or you have Time Twister at three mana. How about like Wheel of Fortune? I mean, granted, obviously it fuels the Belcher decks. Those uh, those there are three mana draw sevens. That's uh. Yeah. Quite but, spicy. But, come on, it's a red spell. It's much better than brainstorm. I, you know what? 
just conspiracies. That's really what Legacy is missing. Didn't even give him a chance. <laughs> At the beginning of the game, if you're playing this in your deck, you may reveal it and name a card. That card cannot be countered the first two times you cast it. Oh, that would be so good. Uh, Dark Ritual and Infernal Tutor. <laughs> <laughs> Lion's Eye Diamond and Goblin Charbelcher. All right, it looks like uh, it looks like Matt needs to go. Well, thanks for tuning in for uh, another episode. Hopefully, you've gotten some value out of it. I hope you don't put us back and decide to crack your fetch land. Okay, that's pretty also cheesy. That was all right. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you, Ben, for coming on. Thank you for having me. And uh, we'll be back soon with another cast. Maybe talking about brainstorming. No. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, Ponda. We don't want to scare away listeners. We'll be back with part two of our six-part series on brainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll even get AJ Soccer to come on and tell us how to play the perfect brainstorm. All right. Thanks for listening. My name is Jake McCory. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Julian Knapp. I'm Matt Pavlik. Thank you for listening. I'm Benjamin Wheeler. Feedback is always appreciated. Email us at everydayeternalcast at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash everydayeternalpodcast or follow us on Twitter at eternalmtg.